Paul received his, his PhD from uh, um, Stanford University um, in, uh, in anthropology and was a, a Brown University undergrad. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your decision to go into filmmaking uh, and your decision to not go into academia, for instance, uh, and sort of what, not only what pushed you into filmmaking, but what pushed you into making these kinds of films, these films that have been, like I said, for, you know, for all of my educational career have been central to how I've learned and also how I've taught. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mario. That, uh, thank you for that nice, uh, introduction and reprise of some of my work. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, basically, I, um, I, I studied anthropology as an undergrad. Uh, well, I, I got into anthropology. It wasn't something I even knew very much about. But when I, when I found anthropology, I, was really, I really felt it was a really powerful tool to, uh, to just understand the world, basically. And, um, but at the same time, I also got very interested in media. I got very interested, basically, in how pervasive media is. Uh, this is again as a as a college student, as a young person. I, I guess I just felt like um, that media. The I'm talking about particularly films, television were were so much so important in terms of how people view the world, how they understand the world, how they understand people that are not like themselves, or even people that are like themselves. And so I was I was basically looking for some kind of way of of, of a bridge between media and anthropology. Um, I, it's, it's kind of a long story to get into all the details, but I basically did did finish my my uh, PhD in anthropology. Again, you I'm sure you know what anthropologists typically do. They go they go to some place far away and study what the natives do. Well, I decided to go to Hollywood and study what the natives do, mm -hmm. and I studied a television studio and looked at how they go about creating television. Not so much from a technical point of view, but from a cultural point of view. And anyway, and just because I wanted to know how, how does this stuff get created? What, what, it, what influences, what informs their, their views? Because again, even at that time, this was obviously many years ago, it was like in the seventies. And in some ways things haven't changed dramatically, but you know, so, so many of the, of the representations that we saw, that I saw about particularly people from my own community as well as other communities seem to be so uninformed basically. So essentially I, I that, that, that um, study that I did, it also got me very interested in sort of seeing what was involved in, in creating media. And I was able to sort of find a way to get involved with, with public television. Again, and that's something I knew very little about at the time also, but I got involved with public television and basically was, you know, started to create documentaries. And I um, kind of was, um, I guess in a way at the right place at the right time, I started doing this in the early, in the early 80s and um, at that time, there was really hardly anybody doing films on, on the Chicano community or on the US-Mexico border region. And so I essentially, and I managed to sort of find a way to connect with public television and just started doing it, just started creating work. I mean, I, I was, I, was uh, I guess, fortunate. I had some, some good breaks along the way, made one film and then you know, was able to make another film and make another film. Um, but clearly I saw, I saw really early on that essentially, um, the kinds of stories that I, or the stories about, about my community, our community were, were so uh, few and far between, especially in terms of, um, well, any kind of media. And I also think that public television also was a place where at least there was some room to do this kind of work. So really my whole career has been principally in public television. The films that you just mentioned um, were all done for, for PBS and have had uh, a good life, both, both not just on public television, but as you point out, in so many uh, university collections and have been very, um, very uh, formative in, you know, people that teach about Chicano studies that they've been, you know, and really I didn't, I didn't, I didn't intend to create a body of work that is the body of work that I, that I've been able to do, but I was just sort of led from one story to another. And of course there's many others that I would love to do, still love to do, but you know, uh, it's always the challenge of finding the resources to do it. But, um, but anyway, that's that's sort of a, at least the brief story of, of how I got into doing documentaries and and features because actually, as you point out, the and the Earth did not swallow him is actually a, a, a narrative film, an adaptation of the Tomas Rivera novel, um, and the Lemon Grove incident is also a sort of a hybrid film, a, a partially a narrative film and a, and a documentary. Again, so I've done more documentary, but a little bit of both, I guess you'd say. Absolutely. Um, so back to you know, thinking about some of your work, I know you received um, 
uh, a, an award from the from CRLA, from the California Rural Legal Assistance, uh, as a cultural worker, right? A, a cultural worker award. And yeah. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what that means to you in terms of being an activist, but being a cultural producer, right? I think we have a lot of young people, obviously, on the, on the webinar, um, who are sort of trying to find their way in this world, especially now with, um, you know, the kind of activism that's happening, the kind of resistance that's happening, the things are, you know, the things that are happening in the streets. Um, I'm wondering if you could sort of talk about what that what that role means for you, um, and whether you can offer some words of, you know, sort of encouragement or, um, you know, because I, I think it's important, especially for again here in the valley, right? We we teach a lot of first generation students, a lot of uh, Mexican American, Chicano, Mexican immigrant students. Um, who are sort of trying to find their way in the world and, um, you know, pri sort of giving them options for what they can do with their, with their education and with their life. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what it means to be a cultural worker and being recognized as somebody who has done social justice work through this cultural lens. Yeah. Well, I think that, that award certainly was very, very meaningful to me and very, you know, I really feel honored that they, they honored my work. And you know, obviously, whenever somebody recognizes your work, you feel you feel good, you feel proud about it. I think it is it is challenging. In fact, in a way, maybe that's also like a little bit of a, a parallel here to the film itself that we that we just saw. I mean, obviously, a chunky is also a great example of a cultural worker, somebody who was very involved as a, a musician, but also as an activist. And I say, I think certainly that's one of the things that that drew me to to his story. I um I feel like um, well. Just briefly, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I've known Chunky for many, many years. I came to San Diego in the late 70s. Chunky came to San Diego in the early 70s. And I met him, I don't even remember the first time I met him, but our, cross, our paths crossed, you know, repeatedly over many, many years. In fact, Chunky also did music. Chunky actually scored music for the Lemon Grove incident for me many years ago and, and some other films. But I think, I think uh, doing cultural work is really important. I mean, I think that we don't, we don't value it enough that we should, but certainly, you know, a song and music, you know, you know, speaks so directly to us, speaks to our souls, speaks to our, both our, our hearts and our, and our heads, you know, and I think that it's something that, um, you know, well, first of all, I think a lot of us grow up in, in environments where we, that surrounds us. I mean, we're, we're in an environment where we see art and music, uh, being an important part of our lives, just in our in our family lives, in our daily community lives, and and something that usually I think is is important in lifting our souls and and making us feel you know better, making us feel a part of a community. Certainly, one of the things that is really important that in Chunky's work and maybe my work as well is the whole idea of building community. That you're really you're really um, co connecting with other people that have similar similar interests and and telling them, hey, you know, you're not alone. You're, you're there's other people that are. That are involved in this struggle, and that and that it is a struggle. That it's going to be it's going to be a, a struggle that's going to be um, uh, probably long lived because there's so many things that, that we need to address. But I think certainly um, you know turning to the to 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 our communities for for sources of inspiration as well as sources of stories because again the in a way the the, the ironic uh, situation is that so many of our stories haven't been told. So that there's a there's a tremendous opportunity for people to tell stories from you know, from the, uh, from the valley, for instance. I mean, certainly the Central Valley is a place that I think is way underrepresented in terms of, you know, stories. And any one of the young people that are there as part of the UC Merced community, I'm sure could tell wonderful stories about their own, their own communities, their own lives, or their parents, their, their, their extended families. Um, not that they just have to do that, but that's certainly something that, you know, would be uh, something that would be very legitimate to, to do and something that I think they would find uh, a lot of a lot of support for because I think that people people are basically hungry for for seeing stories about themselves. You know, I think that we we really don't get to see that enough, and and certainly that's one of the things that in my in my work I have felt that part of what I have wanted to do is sort of uh, capture some of these stories that in some ways have been you know completely forgotten, like the Lemon Grove incident as an example. Again, this is a the the nation's first successful. Uh, uh, challenge to segregation anywhere in the country. This is in 1930, you know, 24 years before Brown versus Board of Education, and yet it's pr practically unknown. I mean, the, the fact that that basically uh, Mexican origin Latino people have been involved in in struggles around getting better education for their children for for a century, for for a long time, and education has been very important to them, and they've they've really gone to 
they've gone to bat for their children. I think that's a story that people need to know. They need to know that there's been a, a long-term engagement of our community with, with issues that matter to us, like, you know, like education, like uh, immigration, and that we haven't been uh, just, you know, um, outsiders or, or just vi uh, victims of these larger things. We've been a participants in this, in this larger struggle. So I think those are all things that go into, um, you know, being a, a cultural worker, basically. Uh, you know, the one the one thing that I think that has become sort of abundantly clear to a lot of people that maybe was not clear when the film was made or while you were making the film is how important music is to our well-being, right? Um, I think during quarantine and our sort of lack of connection with other people and being able to be uh, in the communities the way that we would like to be, um, music has been one of those ways that I think people continue to, to connect with one another, uh, despite the distance. Um, I think now we, you know, we, we see that a lot clearer. Um, but I'm wondering if you thought about that when you were making the film, thinking about Chunky and what Chunky has done for the movement, uh, and what music I think has done for the movement. Uh, um, you know, there's that part of the film where Chunky talks about, you know, strikes are boring. There's no, there's nothing to do and. Uh, how important, you know, for, for those of us who study it, understand, you know, the importance of el teatro and, you know, music and, and also, you know, going all the way back to sort of thinking about Américo Paredes' work and, and the importance of studying music and corridos and songs as primary documents, as, as stories, um, as evidence of what our people have gone through and, what, and, their, and their perseverance. I wonder if that was foremost on your mind when you decided to make the film. Yeah. Well, uh, it was certainly very important. I mean, I think that um, certainly Chunky was a was a tremendous example of, uh, you know, showing us the power of song, the power of music, and the importance of music. I think that, um, you know, I mean, just to sort of the big picture is that sadly a lot of people don't know anything about the civil rights movement in general, much less the Chicano civil rights movement. Um, and of course, this would go as well for people there in the Central Valley. Who you know really were were central to 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 that struggle, uh, which is not to which is which is basically sort of a more of an indictment of our educational system that our educational system really uh, in many cases doesn't teach uh, our young people about about the stories that are really important to their own community and most and mo most young Latinos who uh, get involved and in, find out about this they find out about it in college they don't they don't they maybe they've heard a little bit in high school maybe they've heard of Cesar Chavez but they don't really know too much about it so certainly I think one of my objectives in making the film was to uh, both tell the story of, of Chunky but also the, the story at, at least a little bit of the story of the larger civil rights Chicano civil rights movement and then as, as you point out the importance of music because I think that again uh, people do know, uh, have some idea of civil rights and civil rights movements. You know, I mean, people know about Martin Luther King and the African American civil rights movement. Uh, maybe they know that music also was very important to that movement as well. But certainly in, 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 uh, in, the, in, the, in the Chicano civil rights movement, music was very important. And I think you get a feel from that from the film that, you know, that music was one of those things that really, you know, inspired people, it lifted people up. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, as Chunky says it well, you know, which you just quoted, you know, basically being on strike is very boring. We're just walking around in circles. Hey, you know, bring a guitar. Let's let's uh, let's write about what's going on. We, we start with one verse. We start another verse. As soon we have, you know, La Guitarra Campesina. But the, the music, you know, uh, it captures it captures a sentiment of a community and it, it's, it can be used very powerfully to sort of um, to carry that spirit forward, to inspire that spirit, to to again build community, really, because people, you know, they they feel good when they're when they're hearing music, especially you know good music, music that's speaking to them, that's talking about their own their own experiences. So I think that's also very powerful. And you know, as you point out, I mean, we have a long tradition where where music, corridos in particular, but music in general, has been very very central to uh, sort of the the documentation of our lives. You know where 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 there wasn't you know uh, print journalism wasn't wasn't covering us, but we were we were talking about our, ourselves through through popular culture, through folklore and other things. So those were and and again for people that are looking to study that, those become really important sources for finding out about you know what was happening at any given time. So so yeah, I, I was very um, you know very aware that you know the music was something that was really not ha hadn't been focused on very much. I mean 
even when you say that even the Chicano Civil Rights Movement has been focused on that much, but certainly the specifically the role of music and and hopefully I think uh, clearly will will uh, will be as maybe an example to some some of our younger viewers that you know the music is very important. I'm sure some of you, I'm, I'm sure the many people know some of the younger uh, groups. I mean, maybe I'll just mention briefly, you know, uh, Quetzal Flores, Quetzal Flores, who's part of the group Quetzal, which maybe isn't such a young group now, but Quetzal, uh, who has his own group in Los Angeles, he he scored this film. You know, the film that you just saw was, of course, has all this music by Chunky, but it also is scored, and the score is just a beautiful, beautiful, you know, a lot of pieces of music that are in there that really help to, you know, bridge the transitions and and really do an effective way of carrying carrying the story forward. So Quetzal and, and other other younger, you know, um, La Santa Cecilia, Las Cafeteras, other groups that are basically, and I think in a sense, carrying the carrying the baton forward in terms of using music as part of a larger struggle for social justice. And, you know, just recently, I think it was just last week, they had the, uh, what was it, the Rock the Border, where they had, you know, all these different groups from, you know, from Los Angeles uh, all the way across the country, basically, again, using music to, well, talk to people about the importance of voting and the importance of, you know, what, what's at stake in, in, in our political lives right now. So all of those things I think are, are really important to, um, to that, that give us the, the, the value of what music is in, in, in our lives in a lot of different kinds of ways. Yeah, I think I'll pass over the, the moderating to, to Marisol. Um, so the first question is, um, first of all, they're very thankful that you are here and they wanna say, what inspired you to share Chunky's story through this film? I'm interested in the story behind the film's inspiration. Well, I think I, I said a little bit about that, but you know, basically, I I essentially met Chunky, you know, over forty years ago, and really was always very very impressed with him, with the work that he was doing. Uh, felt that he was um, kind of a just a very committed person to to our community. Uh, I, I think you know, I didn't at the beginning think about necessarily doing a film on him, but the longer that I that I knew him. Uh, the more important I felt it would be to capture, you know, some part of his story. One of the things I did, actually, now quite a few years ago, uh, I, I was always a little bit concerned about Chunky's health. In fact, let me just acknowledge that. Um, uh, well, actually, today, today is actually Chunky's birthday. Today is October 30th. Is Chunky's birthday? I know you didn't pick that date because of that. Um, and and then two days ago was the anniversary of his passing. He passed uh, four years ago. So just to acknowledge, you know, Chunky, Chunky Sanchez Presente. But, um, but he, um, but anyway, he was somebody that, um, uh, well, I, I was concerned about his health, I think, for years. And uh, one of the things that I did now, quite a few years ago, is I, I actually sat him down and did a very extended interview with him. I did sort of a long oral history with him, you know, a pretty uh, high quality interview in terms of the, the technical uh, part of it because I, I just felt like I wanted to get that from him, you know, and, and again, at the time, I really didn't know what I'd be able to do with it, but I, I did, you know, basically uh, sort of put it on the shelf and then essentially uh, felt that, you know, at some point I'd be able to come back to it and, and you know, um, do, a, do something more with it. And that's what I, that's what I finally was able to do, oh, maybe like around um, 2011, 2012, uh, I just decided that I was going to, um, well, we had to do. We actually did several uh, crowdfunding, um, you know, campaigns to raise the money for to do the production and also the post-production. Uh, in fact, that's where that that T-shirt that Mario has on was one of the premiums that we gave for for one of the crowdfunding sources. But anyway, uh, it was just you know uh, um, something that I felt would be important not only just to tell Chunky's story but also as a way of telling this this larger story of of the civil rights movement. That again, I think. For a lot of um, well, for a lot of people, but certainly a lot of younger students, is not something that they know that much about. And hopefully, the film you know can be used as a as a vehicle for you know an introduction to that. And then hopefully, uh, they can also use it to explore a lot more because there's so much more that needs to be looked at and studied and researched. And so anyway, it's kind of a springboard into that that period. Thank you. So that answered a little bit of another question, actually. Somebody asked if it was primarily, uh, if the film was funded primarily through crowdsourcing. Um, well, yeah, a good a good portion of, well, I mean, I'm sure everybody who saw the film, if they just saw it, they saw that long list of individual supporters at the beginning of the film and the, and the end of the film. And I, to me, it was important to 
acknowledge people. I mean, usually when you see a film, you see some major supporters, you know, brought to you by the support of whatever. But these were people that gave anything from, you know, very small donations to maybe a little more substantial. But yeah, over, well, that was like over 600 people, 600 names that you saw just there of people that supported the film. Uh, there were there were a few other uh, bigger bigger um, contributions from some different institutions that we also list at the beginning of the film, but uh, a good a good portion came from crowdfunding, which was, I mean, again, I, I wasn't you know I was looking for resources any place I could find them. Uh, it did it did take a little bit longer to to make this film than I originally anticipated, partly because it was so hard to raise the money for it. But anyway, yeah, a good portion came from from crowdfunding and and lots of people that that knew Chunky and, you know, felt Chunky was really a valuable, his story was very valuable to them. It is. Um, this other question um, kind of deviates a little bit from what we we're talking about, but not really. Um, what do you think Chunky would have thought of the turmoil in 2020? Well, he would, he would have been very involved, uh, basically. I mean, Chunky was from, like I say, from the time I, I first met Chunky, which was in the early, the late 70s, um, you know, he would be at demonstrations, he would be at rallies, he would be there, you know, using his music to to talk about, you know, the, the struggles, the the, the, the the issues that matter to our community. And uh, we see in, in the film, we see the uh, really big, those immigration marches in 2006 that, that Chunky was involved in. These were actually the largest immigration marches ever in San Diego. These were the largest demonstrations in San Diego history, regardless of any kind of subject matter, 50, over 50,000 people um, marched in that or came together in that particular demonstration that we saw in the film. And, and this was part of a larger, you know, um, demonstrations all over the country, uh, you know, millions of people. I, I, I think the figure that I've seen is, well, it's, you know, three or four or five million people, huge demonstrations, over over a million people in Los Angeles, huge numbers of people in Chicago, in, in San Francisco. And anyway, I, that was, you know, Chunky was there, you know, doing doing his his work, applying his skills to to, you know, trying to um, improve the, our lives. And if he were around today, he would be right there. He'd be right front and center, uh, you know, doing everything he could to to uh, to champion, you know, the the uh, our our the struggles that we're involved in, of which there are many, you know. So um, I'm sure he would be, you know. And he is, I'm sure, looking down on us and, and giving us his blessing for, for all the work that, that other that people are doing, cultural workers are doing today to carry on his legacy. Thank you for that. Um, speaking of cultural workers, I think somebody asked, uh, who would you say are the cultural workers now? Certainly all kinds of, you know, uh, musicians, the music, some of the musicians we just spoke about a little bit, musicians, uh, poets, uh, theater people, uh, uh, film people, uh, actors, actresses, all of those people are basically cultural workers. Uh, any, any of us who basically use art in some way or use our imagination. So use, you know, that, I think that was one of the, one of the things that I, I felt was important in Chunky's life was just the power of imagination, the power of using our imaginations to, to apply it to, you know, the world that we live in and, and to also think about a world that could be better than the world we live in. So I think all of the people that are involved in that effort uh, are, are cultural workers. And there's, you know, we know many, many people like that. Each of us run into people like that, know many people like that in our communities. We do, definitely. So I have a, another question here. It says, thank you so much for being here and giving us the opportunity to ask questions. I would like to ask, if you see music being continued to be used as a tool to encourage political and social change, also, in your opinion, do you feel like this has become more common in recent years? I know artists like Bad Bunny do performances and try to raise awareness of social issues and discrimination. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that that uh, probably any of any of the uh, people that are on this uh, this uh, our, our chat today can think of many many examples of people of music that is that is doing exactly what they're talking about. Like I say, I think that I you know I can think of many myself, but. Uh, all of us know people that are very involved, and I think particularly in this moment that we're in, we're seeing a great, a great awareness, a great need for using culture and music and art to basically, um, you know, expand the universe, so to speak, and expand the awareness about some of these issues. And so I think that um, what we're we're trying to accomplish to to sort of move the ball forward in terms of social change and improve the lives of 
uh, the people around us. So yeah, I think there's, I'm, I'm sure that you're, the, the people on this could come up with many, many examples of people that are doing that from, you know, well-known people to people not so well-known. Thank you. Um, so some people are asking, what will be your next film and what are you working on now? Well, one of the things that I'm, I've actually been working quite hard on getting this film out to as many audiences as possible. We've been, we've been basically um, doing uh, festivals of the film. Obviously COVID has really uh, changed things a little bit. We were doing a lot of uh, film festivals prior to uh, the beginning of COVID and also some university screenings. Uh, now we were doing, you know, less of that, although they're very happy to be at, uh, with you all tonight at UC Merced. And um, we just actually did a big screening at uh, also virtual at San Diego State uh, earlier this week. So we're doing, I'm doing more of that, but I have, I have a number of other projects that I, that I hope will also uh, see the light of day. Um, one, one project, one, one of this, the, um, uh, one of my previous films that Mario mentioned before was a, a big series I did on the war between Mexico and the United States, the war of 1846 to 1848. And there is a kind of a, a very uh, an activist priest who was very involved during that time period uh, in New Mexico, and his, his name was uh, Antonio Jose Martinez, and he's somebody that I would love to do more on. So I've developed some some work on that, and 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 other other things that I think hopefully, um, as I said at the beginning, I mean I think for young people who are watching this, uh, there are so many stories that you you know uh, that uh, are not being covered in any other medium, and so you're you have tremendous opportunity to tell some of these stories in whatever way you can through through poetry, through theater, through through films, through short films, whatever whatever means are available uh, to you to to sort of um, capture some of the spirit of what you see around you, the things that you think are important. And I would I would definitely really encourage you to uh, to collaborate with other people in your in your classes, if you can, or in your community who can help you uh, achieve some of the things that you want to do, or also you can also help them achieve the, the things because d doing this kind of culture work is very, collaboration is very, very important because you, you're really working with lots of other people. You need lots of people to, to do different things. And so just basically also learning how to collaborate is itself something that is very, a very important skill to, to, uh, to hone and to develop as much as you can. So somebody asked, who was the person that wanted Chunky to play trumpet? Oh, well, that was his mother. I mean, well, his mother basically, um, she, um, she basically, she was, um, uh, she was very, um, uh, she loved Louis Armstrong, who was a very, you know, well-known uh, trumpeter. And so she liked, um, she thought Chumpy, Trumpy, uh, she thought uh, Trunk, Chunky would, would basically do a nice job uh, doing playing the trumpet and of course that was something that she was that was available there was a small store or a you know a, a music store where you could you know I guess basically rent a trumpet so anyway she had that idea but yeah it was, that, that idea came from his mother I should say that his family his, his mother and his uncles were all very uh, were musicians he grew up in a very musical family his mother was a was a very very uh, uh, a good singer and taught both Chunky and his brother who's you know Ricardo who's in the film who's, who played with he and Chunky played together their whole lives uh, really taught them both a lot about about harmony and about you know about music you know and so he came he came you know that was something that was very central to his to his very being the, the kind of music that he heard in his in his home uh, growing up how lucky um the next question so was chunky playing music toward the end of his life yeah he's played right up you know right up to i mean like i say he did he did um have several uh, you know health issues as he got older um we saw in the film that the the, the when he goes to washington dc that was in 2013 that was that was three years before he passed um, he, but even at that point, he was, he was still playing. He actually played, we, we did a, we did a, um, an event, uh, just like six weeks before he passed, uh, with him where he was playing with other, some of the other musicians, the, um, this, uh, uh, uh La Rondaya Amerindia de Aslan that we, that we mentioned in the film. It was a group that was formed. Uh, they were all students at San Diego State, uh, in the basically late sixties, early seventies. Uh, the people that were part of that group 
have also have continued to to be involved in one way or another. Um, Pepe Villarino, who was the who was the, the the teacher who sort of brought this group together, he's still around, and he's he's brought a lot of them together uh, to to play a. a uh, Miguel Vasquez, who's actually from the Central Valley, um, and other people. In fact, we at some of this went before before COVID. Uh, some of the screenings that we were doing, uh, the rondaya, the now older rondaya, uh, would come and uh, play. We'd have like a nice little sort of musical introduction of you know half an hour, forty minutes uh, prior to prior to the you know the uh, showing of the film, and that that was like a, just a wonderful you know. Um, just you know, introduction basically getting people in the mood, so to speak. Again, what we were talking about before, that music is so important in terms of you know getting us getting us into the spirit of of, of the times. So that actually answered a little bit of the next question, which is, does Chunky's band still play? Well, the Alacranes. Uh, well, Ch Ricardo still plays. His brother, he still plays. Of course, it was Ricardo and Chunky that were sort of the heart of the Alacranes. So without Chunky, you know, uh, but Ricardo still plays and, and a number of the other musicians that, that we see playing with uh, Chunky um, still do play, They're not, not as part of the group because uh, the, the group has sort of in a way disbanded, but, but Chunky, like I say, he was basically playing right up to really the time of his death. And, um, and other, these other musicians, Ricardo still plays on a regular basis and other musicians also play, um, you know, again, in, in San Diego and, and other places. Thank you. And we're down to our final question. Um, is there a way to purchase this film? Oh, well, at the, at the moment, the film is available to, to um, colleges, to schools, basically to educational institutions. And obviously you said, you see Merced has, has purchased it. Uh, it's a, the distributor is Good Docs. So if you, if you are part of a educational institution uh, or even a public library community center, the film is available for purchase. Um, it's not yet available for just individual individual uh, uh, individuals. Uh, I should mention that we do have a, a website at uh, chunkyfilm.com, chunkyfilm.com. And if you go there, you can find out some more information about the film as well as you know screenings that we're doing. You also can actually sign up for our newsletter, which would basically when we do when the film is available, we'll we'll be sending out announcements about you know about the availability of the film when it when it gets to that point. Um, you also for those who are interested, you can also my, my, the website of my company is espinosaproductions.com and that's Espinosa with an S, E-S-P-I-N-O-S-A, espinosaproductions.com. And if you go there, you can find out more about, about my work, uh, some of the other films that Mario mentioned earlier, uh, as well as uh, the, the Chunky film. But yeah, the Chunky film, um, we hope at some point in the future definitely would be available. We also uh, anticipate that the film will be on public television at some point Again, that might vary from uh, from community to, to community, but we are uh, working on trying to make that happen as well. So, um, so you know, keep your eyes open. Uh, if you hear about it, uh, let other people know about it. We'd love to uh, we'd love to have as many people see the film as possible. That's that's really part of the intention of making this film is to, you know, really uh, introduce people to Chunky and and his music and this period that he lived through that I think is very important for our understanding of where we're at, where we are today. Thank you.